Saturday Night Thunder season, we've seen some wild action. From the tiny Ventura Bowl ring to the big paved oval at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Stanley upside down. Oh, my God. To the high bank half mile at historic Winchester. Oh, oh. To the drive, the drive, and it's half the break to avoid hitting. What a fly job. A lot of variety to spice up your Saturday night. So what do we do for an encore? How about Silver Crown cars? A throwback to the days when the IndyCar National Championship included dirt and pavement. These cars launched the careers of Foyt, Andretti, and Unzer. Last year, Johnny Parsons dove to the inside, put a great pass on Jeff Gordon, and took the victory. In a driving career of a quarter century, it was JT's first ever win in the big cars. Power, brave souls and the will to win. They are the local heroes. And they live for Saturday night. Hey, we packed them in to Indianapolis Raceway Park tonight, ladies and gentlemen. And why not? It is a special evening as the USAC Silver Crown cars come to IRP. Hey, we about froze to death last Saturday night at Winchester tonight. A whole lot more traditional June weather here in the Midwest. In fact, a perfect night for racing. And we welcome you to what is going to be, I think, a very enjoyable evening. And the cliche living history comes to mind. How else to describe this car in which Jeff Swindell, by the way, is about to make his third pavement start. Look at the lines. In 1952, Troy Rutman won the Indy 500, the last man to win it in an upright dirt car. For the next 20 20 years, these cars competing on dirt paid points toward the National IndyCar Championship. 20 years ago, these cars had their own division, the Silver Crown Division, and they live to this day as one of the most exciting shows in motorsport. And to owners like Tim Del Rose and Dale Holt, it is the classic lines of these cars that uh, are the link to history, the tie to those great days of old. That's what makes the Silver Crown cars special. It's our only chance to see them this year, and that makes this Saturday Night Thunder special. We'll have an unusual program this evening in that the format has changed significantly from normal. Here's the way it works. The top 14 drivers have already qualified through time trials, and they're headed straight for the main event. We're going to have a 25-lap qualifying race, and as you can hear, they've just fired the engines for that, and that will select the final 10 drivers who will run the feature event tonight, a 100-lapper. I'll tell you something else that makes tonight special. We have the Gary and Larry Show. And you're saying, what's special about that? They have that every Saturday night. I'm not talking about that Gary and Larry. I'm talking about the real Gary and Larry. And you USAC fans know who I'm talking about. Meantime, we got to settle for those Saturday night pretenders who are topside to call the action tonight. Hey, we love them. Gary Lee, the anchor for Saturday Night Thunder and the three-time USAC champion, Larry Rice. Thanks, Dave. Hi, everybody. Larry Dixon is racing. Gary Benton is here as a spectator. You can tell us apart. We're the young ones of that group, all right? Special format, fastest 14 already locked in. Let's take a look at the fastest qualifiers. Jimmy Keeker, he has won already this season on ESPN. The fast qualifier, Johnny Parsons, start outside the front row. He won here last year. Then it's Pankritz, Bliss. Tony Stewart making his Silver Crown debut as fifth quick. Russ Gamester and Jimmy Sills. In the second seven, we have Steve Butler, a former champion. Jim Thomas, Joe Gertie, Jim Mahoney, Davey Hamilton, Eric Gordon, and Paige Jones. Well, Rice Aroni, the shortness of this track and the length of the race make for a very unique challenge for these drivers. That's what really makes this uh, race interesting. The fact that you have to have discipline, you have to have a lot of concentration, and you have to pace yourself. That's what gives the veterans a real advantage here. A guy like Johnny Parsons, a guy like George Snyder. Both these guys have run the Indianapolis 500. They've run a lot of 100-lap dirt car races around the country. They know how to pace themselves. They know how to go fast, but slow enough to make that race car last at the same time. This is the third stop on the USAC Valvoline Silver Crown Series. Jimmy Keeker victorious at Phoenix back in January on the paved mile on the dirt track, the mile dirt at the Indiana State Fairgrounds last month. Leland McSpadden was victorious. Gotts, really, he leads the point standings. They're racing here this evening, Dave. Back to you in the pit area. We've had pretty fair success our last two visits on Saturday Night Thunder in picking the winners. We profiled Jim Keeker, he went out and won the sprint car race. And then we profiled Steve Butler, and he went out and won the sprint car race. So who's going to win tonight? 
I kind of like Johnny Parsons. I thought he was pretty impressive here a year ago in winning it. And what the heck, he got married this week. I think it'd make a great wedding present. They're out there warming him up, and that means we're just about set to kick it off here on Saturday Night Thunder. Saturday Night Thunder is brought to you by Bud Dry. Dry brewed so it drinks light, yet satisfies completely. And by GMC Truck, the strength of experience. We'll take a break and come right back to Indianapolis Raceway Park with our 25-lap qualifying race for the Silver Crown cars. Stay with us. behind in that seven wins and that's tied for fourth all-time in the East Silver Crown win list. And those guys are trying to strike the last two All right, field is on the racetrack and warming up as we prepare for the 25-lap qualifying event here. The fastest 14 time trialers. Let's take a look at the starting lineup. Tyus Carlson sitting on the pole. Stevie Reeves right alongside. Remember, the top 10 will move on. Mark Alderson and the veteran Jack Hewitt starting alongside in row two. We go back and pick up row number three. Leland McSpadden, the Tempe Tornado, along with Ziggy, the old veteran George Snyder. It's not true. He's driven every one of these races ever run. Robbie Stanley, the reigning sprint car champion, alongside Kerry Foss in row four. We go back and pick up row five where you'll find Bill Bow and Mike Fedorchek and we've seen turn a lot of laps in the midget on this racetrack picking up row six Bob Sacconi in the number 50 easy to pick out that paint job Tony Elliott alongside after a strong qualifying run here Warren Mockler another veteran in row seven Trey House will line up in 14th starting spot as we look for the 10 fastest qualifiers to move on into the championship feature Larry Dixon and Greg Staub back in row eight as the field come around for what should be the final pace lap. Perry Farrell and Doug Kalitta. Kalitta, again, making the transition to Silver Crown. Jeff Swindell makes his third start ever on pavement tonight with Donnie Adams alongside in row 10. Stan Fox, yeah, the Indy 500's over. He can go back to racing the little racetracks. Bruce Field alongside in row 11 as the cars come up to temperature. Jim McLean rounding out the starting lineup from row 12. Indianapolis Raceway Park with a very special evening as the Silver Crown cars come here for their only visit on Saturday Night Thunder. And with that, let's go to the guys who will call the action. Garrett Lair, this is going to be good stuff. I don't think we're supposed to play favorites, but I have to say this is one of my favorite races to televise all year long. A special format. This is the 25-lap Jonathan Bird Cafeteria Qualifier. Jonathan Bird, a big, big race fan, literally and figuratively from uh, the Greenwood area south of Indianapolis with a big, in fact, I think the country's biggest cafeteria just off Interstate 65. He always sponsors this race every year. With our format, as we indicated, the fastest four, 14, are locked into the starting lineup. We will transfer the first 10 finishers from this event. They are starting straight up. And there's some heavy hitters in here. Hewitt, Snyder, McSpadden, Stanley. I mean, some guys that you usually see right up front are in this what we call semi or last chance race. And they know that they have to run good for 25 laps in order to make the feature. Tice Carlson on the front row starting from the pole in uh, number 84. He was involved in that fiery melee at Winchester last week. Once again, nobody was injured. And this week, you received a telephone call from uh, the youngster who was involved in that saying thank everybody for their support. That's right. Dave Durnwald wanted everybody to know, the fire crew, all the drivers who ran in there to help him, and everybody involved, how thankful he was for their help and how much he appreciated it. Tyce Carlson up from the midget wars, but he loses the lead right away to Stevie Reeves. Stevie Reeves drove this car one time last year. This car at one time was owned by A.J. Foyt. He drove it, and now he's back in the seat at number 37. He leads down the backstretch. That's Jack Hewitt right behind him, already making a bid for the lead. In under him, he's going to slide up. Oh, almost touched wheels right there. Stevie Reeves uh, had to let off the throttle and let him on by. Well, Jack Hewitt did not qualify as well as he had expected, so he has to go through this 25-lap qualifier. Strategy uh, a little different here. It's only 25 laps in length. Well, there's not much strategy here, Gary. You have to go for it. You know that everybody behind you is going to go for it, and you have to run as fast as your race car will go because you can't afford to lay back, save tires, do any of that sort of stuff. It's only 25 laps, and you've got to make a feature race. That was McSpadden in that white car coming sliding up in front of Mark Olsen in the blue car right there and took the spot away from him. That's George Snyder in that black number 11. 
driver right behind, also trying to gain a spot or two. Neil McSpadden, the Tempe Tornado, won out at Ventura in a midget race, but he has limited experience on the pavement, but he also won a USAC sprint car race on the paved mile at Phoenix a few years ago, so he's good no matter what surface he's on. Neil McSpadden is very experienced. He knows exactly what to do in a race car, and he is doing real well on the pavement, although a lot of people didn't expect. That 47 car, that black car there, oh, look at this. Stan Fox in the Jack's Tool Rental. That's the Gary Runyon car. Did not qualify well. They've had some trouble with that car. He's back in the uh, open wheel wars for the first time in really a number of months. He devoted his time to the Speedway, the Indianapolis 500, and racing some ARCA, and the evening is over for Stan Fox. That's right. He just started back in the short track cars and already has had some problems. But look at this. Stevie Reeves is not letting Jack Hewitt get away from him. Look at Ciccone in that orange car. That's Larry Nixon in the car right behind him. Give him a little bump right there. But that's Ciccone going around. 81 Trey House in the white car down on the inside, and it's not hard to pick out that iridescent. Oh, he sees some smoke coming off of Trey's right rear tire off that fourth corner. That is 12th, 13th, and 14th. But remember, only the top 10 transfers. So these guys have to move up. There is a Bob Sacconi. He won this race a few years ago when we had the twin 75 lappers. He and Schrader won on that particular evening. But right now, he's being passed by a three-time USAC sprint car champion, Larry Dixon. Lightning Larry on the inside, trying to move up his position. But he has to move up at least two more to make it to the top 10. That iridescent car there is owned by one of the guys who helped me get to the Indianapolis Speedway back in 1978. Bill O'Connor, he's a U.S. Air pilot, and it doesn't look like uh, sacconi has got that thing handling quite like he'd like to have it tonight. He keeps uh, moving back. He's lost a couple of spots here in the last few laps. We go back to the front of the pack, car number 21, Jack Hewitt, a former Silver Crown champion. Back one year, he won every Silver Crown race that was contested on dirt. The one he didn't win was right here. I think he finished fifth or sixth that night. That's right, and he did a very good job on some uh, on a car that really wasn't real competitive on the pavement at that time. Eight laps down now. That looks like George Snyder's got a problem. He's far down to the bottom, Gary. He uh, looks like his evening is over already. And we talked about how his experience would pay off, but it's not going to pay off in the pits. A.J. Foyt was in Indianapolis this week helping George work on that car before Tex went on up to... Uh, Milwaukee for the IndyCar race, and a look again as he slides it off the corner of Jack Hewitt out of Troy, Ohio. Yeah, he's doing a very good job with that race car. He's running it nice and smooth and straight. He gets a little loose coming off the corners, but he's still running pretty quick with that race car. And he knows he's got to run quick to stay in front of everybody that's uh, trying to chase him down. The white blue number 48 about to be passed is Robbie Stanley, the defending USAC Sprint Car champion. Tony Elliott just went by in 18, and there goes the number 81 car, Trey House. Yeah, he doesn't see. He's pushing the front end. Look at that right front tire smoke. He's pushing the front end real bad on that race car. He's lucky if he gets a turn coming off the corner. That's why he's holding up all that traffic back there. He gets to the middle of the corner. Look at that right front pushing so bad. That's the best example that we have seen all season of a car pushing. Boy, you don't see the right front smoke like that very often. It's usually the right rear. One of those cars, I think it was Trey House, that was going underneath him, was smoking the right rear at the same time he was smoke in the right front. Bill Bowie goes by in that 78 car, and here comes the 73 car of Larry Dixon. Dixon moves to the inside of Bowie. Yeah, he's Dixon's moving right on up. He's going to make the top 10 if he keeps passing cars at this rate. He's passed several cars, and he started way in the back of the field. Larry Dixon is a three-time USAC sprint car champion, uh, retired, if you want to use that term, then came back after his sabbatical and said, I really enjoy running these cars. This car is owned by his brother who is also a former driver, so if Larry doesn't do so well, his brother might get in it. Well, he's doing a pretty good job right now. I don't think he stands much chance of getting uh, fired at this point because he is running very quick. We'll also tell you that Robbie Stanley has pulled behind the pit wall. He is out of the race. We go back to the front of the pack. There is uh, Jack Hewitt. He continues to lead, and he works on lap 14. This is a 25-lap qualifier. And only the first 10 finishers will advance. There you are, a two-time Silver Crown champion. Actually, he has a master strategy when it comes to running the dirt track. Does not qualify all that well, but toward the end of the 100 lapper, he's there. Yeah, his Four, strategy is... and six right here, Larry. I think your strategy is just stand on the gas all the time. Just hope everybody else doesn't catch you. These are fourth, fifth, and sixth right here. Mark Alderson in the blue car. Uh, running pretty well. Trying to work on the car in front of him. Trying to get a brownie, but he just can't quite do it. It doesn't look like this point. Carlson, Tice Carlson, and that's a red white number 84. Alderson, I talked to Mark before uh, the practice session. He said he got a call this morning from Steve Stav. Steve said, come over and race tonight. And it looks like Kerry Foss, that black 47 car, it looks like the inexperience with him is having a little bit of a problem. The back end's getting a little loose. See the blue smoke rolling off that thing. Uh, he's just running a little bit too hard. He got that right rear hot already. Let's get Kerry Foss a 
California Racing Association veteran on the dirt. So once again, a uh, new uh, chassis that uh, he and his dad put together uh, from the Bob East shop. And uh, they're, they're just getting experience, getting laps in the race car on pavement. Exactly. He's getting experience. He's, that's all you can do. You get in there and you run and hope that you gain some, some experience and do well. Once again, a look there at Tice Carlson in the red and white 84. He's being pressured right now by Mark Alderson. We go back to the front of the pack. And that, once again, is Jack Hewitt. Jack has now completed 17 laps. And there is the transfer position. Well, this is quite a battle back here for back. I think that's 9th, 10th, and 11th, 12th, and 13th right there. So uh, Larry Dixon can't afford to let anybody get on his back. He's uh, working very hard there on Trey House, but he can't quite get around him. And that's Warren Mockler right behind. It's wanting that, it's wanting that position. That's 9th, 10th, and 11th. So one of those guys is not going to be in the feature race. Well, right now, Dixon rides in 10th position. Ooh, look at this. He, all, he lost it right there. Warren Mockler waited his chance, pulled right on by him on the outside in turn four when Larry Dixon tried to go around Trey House on the low side. Now, Larry Dixon's going to have to work very hard to gain that position back, and it looked like he pushed the front end and lost a lot of ground up coming off the two. Several car lengths going on the back stretch, and now Mockler gets around Trey House for one more position. Insurance positions now for Mockler. Well, this is going to be the battle right here to see if Larry Dixon can catch back up with Trey House and gain that position back. Trey House is losing the rear, the rear end on that car. Hey, look at that red number five. Does that bring back memories? No, that's not Larry Rice in there. That's Doug Coletta. That's Doug Coletta. The that's racer Jeff that has made his debut this evening. Fourth, fifth, and sixth battling right here. Down the back stretch. As we get to the waning lap of this race, lap 21 about to be completed by your leader, Jack Hewitt. As we take a look at uh, Trey House, the 81 car, Tice Carlson, 84, and look at the smoke coming off Terry Boss's number uh, 47, and look at Alderson, look to the outside. I think right now Trey House may be holding those guys up. Well, it looks like uh, that's uh, Leland McSpadden, I think, right there. That's, that's a 61 car. car Carl, Tice Carlson is trying to get around McSpadden, and Alderson trying to get around him. Terry Boss back there, he's still smoking that right rear tire like crazy, but he's going pretty quick while he's doing it. Look at this. Now everybody's going to smoke. Them. That's the way you drive a sprint car on a dirt track, and this is not a dirt track. <laughs> These are not sprint cars. Sure looks exciting, but I tell you what, in that 100-lap race, they do that very, very many times. They'll, They'll be, be in the pits. They'll point. They'll be in the pits changing tires. Uh oh, right oh, over. He lost the left rear. Hollers are trying to hang on. Look at this driving job. He looks back. No, there's no, <laughs> there's no left rear. They're hanging oh, on. Look out! Look out! Look out! Oh, he just did kiss the wall. I'll what a job of driving by Mark Alderson and the Steve Staff prepared car. Most times when people say he did a heck of a job of driving, I said, that's crazy. He was just hanging on for dear life, didn't have anything to do with it. But that he time, it. he did a very good job keeping that thing straight for a long, long time around that corner until he just couldn't do it anymore. I mean, he, he looked down, he knew what the problem was, but uh, when you only got three wheels, it's pretty hard to keep him going straight. It's a lot easier, though, if you lose that back tire than lose a front tire. Uh, if, it, if that had been a right front tire, he would have definitely been in the fence and in big trouble. But he, look at this. He's going down. He knows something. He's pulled down to the inside. He knew there was the problem before it ever came up. He was clear on the inside of the racetrack, away from everybody, out of the way. But right there, look at him. He's steering it. He's turning left. He's turning right. He, he knows that there's a big problem. Look how hard it is. Oh, he, there, he where is that tire? <laughs> There it is. Up. Oh, see, he shouldn't have looked down. That's uh, when that's, he got in trouble. That's when he cocked it in the rear and started to go around one way. He goes to correct, and he spins back the other way. No left rear side bite. When she started going to the left, he was in big trouble. Nothing there to catch him. Let's take one more look. Obviously, he had some uh, indication there was a problem. He came off the second corner, a bit of smoke right there, and here he loses that left rear and goes for a long slide of the belly pan down the back stretch. Exactly, Gary. He knew there was a problem, and it pulled way down out of everybody's way, and that was very fortunate for them because he would have caused a big crash if he hadn't. Right there, there's no left rear side bite. Maybe and that just did a reverse spin on him up into the fence. Oh, here's a nice little replay from the infield camera. Look, see how far he, he knew the problem. He was trying to haul that thing down to the inside of the racetrack and did a very good job of getting out of other people's way. That was really the best thing he did was get out of the other competitor's way. Hey, Day, the sparks are flying already, but two heavy hitters are spectators. And I don't think they're either one very happy to be talking to me under this circumstance, but they have both graciously agreed to come over here and do it. Stan Fox, we'll start with you. What happened? Oh, we just had some gearbox trouble tonight. We changed it, and the uh, same thing happened to us in the semi. So, uh, you know, it just wasn't our night, I guess. I'd like to thank Gary Running for bringing it out. And I had Stevie Reeves test the thing. Maybe he jinxed it. Next time I'm going to test it myself. 
How you like being back on the uh, little racetracks after a good, uh, good performance, a good month of May at Indy up until the end? Well, we had a great May, and uh, you know, it, I always consider it like a pendulum. And right now, the pendulum's on the backside. We just got to get our luck going the other way. But I love the short track racing, and uh, we plan on doing more. Of it. You keep coming out on Saturday Night Thunder. We'll turn that luck around. That is Stan Fox. Last year, I had the misfortune of talking to this guy under somewhat similar circumstances, but tonight, at least, George Snyder gets to bring the car home in one piece. George, what happened? Well, we've been having a little handling problem ever since we got here. The uh, the right front seems to be bouncing real bad when you get in the middle of the corner, and uh, these cars, as light as they are on all the aluminum pieces, I'm just afraid it's going to bounce the bass, going to break something, so I just pulled it in. They told me that A.J. was up to help you get the thing set up here during the week. Has he forgotten how to do that, or what's the problem? No, I don't think he has. He was up, and uh, we were over to the Speedway all week. But, uh, no, it's just it's just something we can't pinpoint. We had a problem with the car at Phoenix on the pavement, and uh, we just haven't ironed it out yet. Still one of the greats in the game, and part of greatness is knowing when it's time to park it. That's George Snyder. We'll be back to finish up this 25-lapper right after this timeout. We're thundering on a Saturday night. Back at Indianapolis Raceway Park, we are under yellow for the spectacular incident for Mark Alderson, who did, and indeed, I agree with you, Gary, a great job at driving and keeping that car from getting into major trouble. We can update what happened to Robbie Stanley, the reigning sprint car champion, as he blistered the right front tire. Right front tire, they tell me, is what put Robbie Stanley on the sidelines. Leland McSpadden has also pulled out of the race. We'll get an update on that. Right front, sound right to you, Larry Rice? Sounds right to me, David. It was definitely smoking. We don't see the right front smoke off of those things very often, but that thing, for some reason, developed terminal non-steer, non-turn, and it just uh, burned the right front right off of it in about three or four laps. Now, would you find that? Would you find that in a racing dictionary? Terminal non-steer. Well, I, it's in my dictionary, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> What can I say? We have a vocabulary of our own in this uh, <laughs> game of motorsports. We still have three laps to go, and there is a look at your leader uh, trying to keep those tires warm, Jack Hewitt. And there, look at their 14 career USAC Silver Crown wins. And he is trying to uh, find a position in the uh, starting lineup for our Mellow Yellow 100 here at Indianapolis Raceway Park tonight. 11 cars are on the lead lap. On second place, number 37, that is uh, Stevie Reed. They're like four lap cars from first and second as Wally Shearer out as three laps to go and once again with that uh, lap traffic we can't tell you Larry Dixon fans he is now ninth after starting 15th with the top 10 will transfer yeah I think Jack Hewitt had, has things well in hand here I don't think anybody's going to get through that traffic and up to him to defeat him so that means he'll start 15th in the uh, feature race which will be a pretty good starting spot for him and I think he'll be happy with that the real battle is going to be uh, further back to see who's going to actually make the race who is here comes Stevie Reeves in that black car He's going to try to gain a couple spots, and that's Tyus Carlson in that 74 car on the outside of him, the red one. 84, 84 car. Two laps to go, and they're looking at second place in black 37 with the gold numerals, the white flag out right now for your leader. Jack Hewitt, by virtue of winning 14 of these Silver Crown uh, races, is the winningest driver in Silver Crown competition. You have won five. You know how tough it is to win one. He's won 14 of them. Well, he was almost unbeatable there for a period of a couple of years. As a matter of fact, I think he had a two-year stretch that he only got defeated. I think I, I finally did beat him in Florida at the beginning of the third year, the only time he got beat. So it was a, a pretty good stint for him, but uh, he hasn't really ever liked the pavement all that well. Well, he takes the victory here in the 25 lap. Jonathan Bird cafeteria qualifier. And this is a pavement track, but I still have to believe they can learn something about this racetrack by going through that semi. Oh, sure they can. They have. To, it's just like every other process. You have to learn every time you go on the racetrack. The best thing that Jack Hewitt could probably do was go out there and run the semi, but because for him, he's not as used to it as a lot of the other veterans on the pavement. Well, as we told you, a unique format for the Silver Crown Mellow Yellow 100 because the 25-lap uh, qualifier there producing 10 more starters to comprise our 24 car starting field and we will go 100 laps over the uh, six tenths of a mile track here at Indianapolis Raceway Park as we take a look at uh, Jack Hewitt and uh, some of our supporters good luck to Paige Jones he'll be racing here this evening come back and join us
back at Indianapolis Raceway Park, our 25-lap qualifying race for the Silver Crown. 100-lap feature tonight is complete, and the man who is picking up the Jonathan Bird Cafeteria Trophy is Jack Hewitt, who just has incredible experience on pavement and loves racing this kind of race, right? Uh, yeah, this is it. This is my kind of racing right here. <laughs> what did you tell me just a minute ago? You don't have the patience, you said, to race pay, uh, pavement. You know, here you can ease up on a guy and ease up on him inch and inch, and then all of a sudden you make one mistake and you lose... 10 feet, and then you got to start the whole process over again. And usually on dirt, you make one mistake, and you make it up in one lap. It don't take you five or six. So I just don't have the patience for the pavement. Well, now, watching that 25 laps, I didn't see you make any mistakes. Did you make some I missed? The last lap, I kind of got a little sideways right there. But I guess you got to test to see how hard you can run them. The guys in the booth made the point that running 25 laps here for you is probably a pretty good deal, because getting that experience under your belt on this racetrack might help you for the feature. What do you think the chances are in the 100 lapper? Well, I think right then we felt pretty good. I got a little loose at the end, but I needed the 25 practice laps because uh, hot lapping and qualifying is not one of my better deals, you know. And then we got a chance to race against other cars and everything, and, and it helped me. It's going to be a pretty good ways to the front with the first 14 starting straight up. you got 14 guys to pass out there from your starting spot. Is that realistic? Can you win this thing? Well, it's 100 laps, you know. This isn't a 25 or 30 lap sprint car race, and uh, anytime we got a race that long, it don't make no difference, you know. It just uh, it takes a lot to get the thing. Yeah. That, takes a lot. yeah, that one'll do. We've got a lot of sponsors, you know, without battling, and guys like Jonathan Bird here to sponsor the special races and things like that, and his race cars. You know, we got J.W. Hunt, uh, Carrera Shocks, Gertie Motors has been a big help to us, and uh, Fram, Aurora. We just got so many sponsors, I, I lose half track but without them and the crew none of this would be possible for me i hesitate to give race drivers experience keep one thing in mind it takes four times as much patience in the next race okay that's jack hewitt he has won the qualifying race he's getting set to go 100 laps in the feature from 15 starting spot and we'll be back to show it all to you on saturday night thunder USAC. The most diversified sanctioning body in auto racing sanctions the Indianapolis 500-mile race for the 37th consecutive year in 1992 as part of a racing schedule involving more than 160 exciting open-wheel events. Be there for every green flag. USAC is bigger and better than ever. Be a part of the action by writing for membership information to the United States Auto Club. And don't miss a single exciting lap. Side-by-side, Coletta down low. Hey, you like that Winchester action? We're going back there next Saturday night for the July 4th USAC Midget Race. Then coming right back here to IRP the following Saturday night. USAC Midget at Indianapolis Raceway Park. And this has been a hectic, diverse weekend for USAC. The USAC National Midgets last night making its first appearance in 22 years at Bloomington Speedway in uh, Bloomington, Indiana. Russ Gamester victorious there. And after this evening's Silver Crown race here at Raceway Park, the sprint cars stop at Kokomo Speedway in Kokomo, Indiana. And a couple of weeks ago, well, Leonard Beck presented a couple of uh, sandwiches to Larry Rice and to me up here in the booth. And tonight, Leonard Beck has outdone himself. Dave, what do you have down there? <laughs> well, guys, I have always made it a point to try and learn from my heroes. And one of my heroes is Benny Parsons. And I watched Benny go to all those Benny buffets, and I thought, maybe, maybe, someday I'm going to get my chance. When I come to IRP, I always get that sausage sandwich. Will you take a look? at what these guys have got here tonight. I'm talking sausage sandwich that just doesn't quit. Cause you got it all in there, four feet long. And let me check, I wanna make, yeah, onions, green peppers. This looks pretty good. You think this is fit to eat? Why, sure it is. You bet it is, I can attest to that. We usually get one about this long. We're gonna be eating for a while here, guys. Thank you very much. If you just keep that close by, don't let it get too far away. Thank you very much. He said I wasn't eating right. Well, they're going to solve that problem here tonight. We got a four-foot sausage, onion, and pepper sandwich from the guys at Leonardo's here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. Let me tell you that we are aware and we are sensitive to the fact that a lot of you folks missed a significant part of the show last week when we were at Winchester. We had a dramatic sprint car race, but what happened was a power failure in Bristol at ESPN, so certain cable systems around the country missed the last part of it. We're going to recap it for you. 
Lap three of the main event, the black car at the top of your screen is Rick Howerton. He gets sideways, overcorrects, turns into the wall. Behind him come Dave Dernwald and Tice Carlson with no place to go. Dernwald hits first, Carlson hits the back of both of them. Two of the fuel cells erupt, and Dernwald's car becomes an inferno. He battles desperately to escape. The fire crews had the blaze out in 25 seconds. But about this time, a lot of cable systems across the country lost the signal. Not even Dave Dernwald's mother was able to hear this interview as we caught up with the victim of the crash. Can you give us some sensation as we look at the, again at the crash of what went through your mind, particularly as regards the fire? As, mar as far as the fire, I've been on fire one other time. And you just want to get out. You just want somebody to get to you as fast as possible. It got hot in there. I just wanted to get out of it. Were you able to, to help yourself? I mean, you, were, yeah, you weren't uh, dingy. You were able to, to respond and get got, the wheel loose? I think I got myself out. Got, I don't know if it, I got the wheel loose or not. I just wanted to get out, and I just bailed out. I probably hurt myself more just get, diving out of the car than anything. Well, we were able to get the word to your folks real quick. We okay. got the word that you wanted to tell everybody you were mom, okay. Back, my mom back in the home, all right. Indeed, he was okay, and so was the race. Look at Steve Butler on the bottom. Makes a great move, a little tire tap with Tony Stewart, and he's into the lead. A late run from Robbie Stanley in the yellow. Number one made it a close finish. Butler wins a heart stopper at Winchester. Take a look at the point standings as a result of that action. Keeker now the leader by a narrow margin over Eric Gordon. Robbie Stanley with third in the points after a close second place finish. Butler moves up nicely and Tony Stewart rounding out the top five. I won't go into all the details of the technical difficulty that uh, enabled some cable systems to get the signal for the, le right, the last of the telecast last week and others not. But one of the ironies is that Dave Dernwald's mother did not see that interview and she was calling the racetrack frantically wondering what had happened. The good news and the end of the story is that Dave was okay. And a little later, uh, Larry Rice is going to take a look at why Dave was okay. The issue of safety always looming in our minds when we come to the races. Talk about midgets, talk about sprints, talk about silver crown cars. What are the differences? Well, who better to ask than Larry Rice? On Saturday Night Thunder, we show you basically three different kinds of cars. The first is a midget. It is a 66-inch wheelbase race car that weighs about 900 pounds and has a four-cylinder, 300-horsepower engine in it. These cars are obviously the smallest race cars that we show you. Because they're so small, it makes it kind of hard for the driver to get in and out of. The cockpit area is very small. But these cars are very quick, they're very nimble, and very responsive. They're a lot of fun to drive. The next class we have are the sprint cars. The sprint cars are two feet longer, they're about a foot wider, and they weigh about 500 pounds more than a midget. Most of them have a V8 engine in them, a 400 cubic inch, 800 horsepower V8. This particular one has a six cylinder engine in it that makes about 600 horsepower. Because it has less horsepower, it, has, it can weigh 200 pounds less. These cars have the highest horsepower to weight ratio of anything we show you here on Saturday Night Thunder. They're a brute to drive, but they're still a lot of fun. What we're gonna see tonight though, are the Silver Crown cars. These are the Papa Bears. These are the biggest cars that we have. These cars are just like the cars they used to run in Indianapolis back in the 1950s. These cars are a foot longer than a sprint car. They're about the same width and about the same weight. They have a 350 cubic inch V8 engine in them, but they still make about 800 horsepower. These cars have gone over a lot of changes over the years. One of the big changes is you see a lot of carbon fiber nowadays that you didn't used to see. For a driver, these are a lot of fun, but you have to be careful because at the start of the race, you have a 500 pound weight load hanging over the back axle, 500 pounds worth of fuel. But if the driver can keep that in mind and keep the race car straight, these things are the most fun of all. All right, thank you very much, Larry. We're going to keep that guy hustling tonight. We've broken him from his uh, position up high overlooking Indianapolis Raceway Park, and he is now patrolling the pit area here to uh, come up with some news going to help bring us up to date on what's happening here in this Silver Crown Division. One of the things that's happening in the Silver Crown Division involves the point standings. Let's take a look, first of all, at where we stand coming in, and then note that Leland McSpadden, the point leader, and Jeff Swindell, the second-ranked driver, neither one made the feature tonight. So Jack Hewitt, our 25-lap winner, is in position to move up here tonight. Nossinger and Kading are not here. You'll be looking at a shuffled-up top five. Thunderheads in Greenville, Indiana, tuned in tonight. We're glad you're here. We'll be right back. Hey, 
coming up tomorrow night, ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Chicago White Sox traveling to the Bronx to take on the Yankees. Thomas and Kelly, yes, they will unlimber the lumber. Join John Miller and Joe Morgan. Call in the action, 8 o'clock tomorrow night, Sunday Night Baseball. I don't think unlimber the lumber is such an unusual choice of uh, words. You wouldn't believe the grief I've gotten here. I, what do I know about baseball? Got a lot of news we're going to update you on here. It's a tradition. It's Saturday Night Thunder. When we take this little break tonight, the break is a little longer than normal. Turnaround time for Hewitt and the rest from the 25-lapper to get set for that long and grueling 100-lap main event. But we've got a lot of interesting things for you during the break, including, as promised, the real Gary and Larry show. But we're going to begin, as we said, with other news from around the world of racing. The Indy cars are on the oval at Milwaukee. Bobby Rahal has the pole with Rick Mears alongside Goodyear, Brayton, and Andretti rounding out the top five. Let's go on back ten spots. Fittipaldi, Eddie Cheever, John Andretti, Danny Sullivan, and Mario Andretti rounding out the top ten. Tell you a quick interesting story here. Rahal was fastest from the moment they unloaded it. Bozell and Brayton, as you saw, Brayton qualified in the top five. Bozell was also very quick. None of those three drivers tested at Milwaukee. Dick Simon said, hey, we learned something here. Maybe we should just ban testing as a way to reduce the cost of racing. Meanwhile, up at Watkins Glen, a doubleheader with uh, the IMSA Camel GT, Camel Continental tomorrow. Davy Jones on the pole, surprise in a Jaguar. Uh, Juan Manuel Fangio alongside, then P.J. Jones, Price Cobb, and Jeff Brabham coming off a 24-hour uh, Nissan test down at Daytona with uh, their new car. They're going to combine the Nismo and Niptec effort for the 1993 24-hour down there, so they were in doing some testing this week, which we understand went very well. They had a softball game in conjunction with that event. They took the IMSA drivers and matched them up against the Bush Grand National guys who race today. Here's the way it worked out. The final score was 5-4 to four in favor of the stock car drivers. In the bottom half of the final inning, the sports car guys had the bases loaded. Kenny Wallace out of the supercar division at the plate. Long fly ball caught by Kenny Wallace. End of the ball game. Kenny Wallace, of course, the stock car driver playing deep center field. Wallace flies out to Wallace and a 5-4 to four final score as the outcome bases were loaded at the time. I don't know what the odds are against that. Can we show uh, the Bush Grand National results from today? We got those guys. I love it when they're right on top of it. Ernie Irvin, one of the world's great road racers, witnessed the results today. His second consecutive victory on racetracks where they have to turn right. Todd Bodine finishing second. Terry Labonte, Joe Nemechek, and Dave Resendez rounding out the top five. Quick look at NHRA qualifying from up in uh, San Air, Quebec. Pat Austin, top qualifier in top fuel at 495. And funny car, Al Hoffman comes away as fast qualifier. Wojo, Warren Johnson tops in pro stock. Finals up there, of course, are set for tomorrow. Now, as we look ahead uh, to the world of outlaw action, they are uh, running this weekend. Earlier this weekend, they were earlier this week, rather, they were out at Oklahoma City. And Bob Jenkins filed this report on the action there. The World of Outlaw Sprinters have been making up rain dates. Kenny Jacobs won at Topeka Tuesday night, then it was on here to Oklahoma City. This 30-lapper saw some great racing. Johnny Herrera in red took the lead from Steve Kinzer on lap 13 and then spent many circuits trying to hold on to the advantage. The battle was interrupted by a red flag. Watch the upper right of your screen. That's Rod Henderson over the guardrail, but he escaped without injury. When racing resumed, so did the Kinzer-Herrera battle. Steve had to use the infield, but got the job done. He denied Herrera his second career victory while he won his 12th of the year. All right, thank you very much, Bob. From there, it was on to Lincoln, Nebraska. Steve Kinzer, the winner last night over Sammy Swindell. Mark Kinzer, Jumpin' Jack, and Craig Keel rounding out the uh, top five, and that's the 12th win of the year for Steve Kinzer, the all-time great in the sprint car division. Some of our Saturday Night Thunder regulars were in action last night, Friday night action on the dirt, and it was quite a race. Take a look. USAC Midget's first time at Bloomington in 22 years, and it didn't take long for things to get exciting. On the scorecard, Aaron Mosley reads OOP, out of park. Big flip. Fortunately, Aaron was okay. 
We'll fast forward to the main event, and it, too, was a bit wild early on. Stevie Reeves and Mike Stryker side-by-side side into the first turn. Jimmy Sills lurking down there on the bottom. Great race. And you're thinking, hey, all the action's right up at the front of the field. Well, you're wrong. All the action is back in the middle of the pack where Doug Galitta ends up on his head after tangling with Dan Ford. Again, nobody hurt. You can see Doug climbing out of his machine upside down. Restart of the main event looks somewhat similar. Three-car tangle this time. Andy Mishner got sideways, took out Roy Carruthers, and Jimmy Sills, who's back tonight. We finally get this thing going with a good battle for second spot. Drynan in white, that's Danny Drynan, with Tony Elliott in blue up top. And they will run in that order to the wire. Drynan hanging on for second spot. But they got nowhere close to the leader. Russ Gamester won this thing absolutely going away. In fact, he led virtually the entire race. Congratulations to Russ Gamester, winner last night at Bloomington. So the results are Russ Gamester on top with Drynan and Elliott second and third. Donnie Lehman and Mike Stryker rounding out the top five. That was the first time since 1970 that the Midgets had raced on dirt down at Bloomington Speedway. And in 1970, the legendary Bob Tattersall won the race driving a car built by the Gamester family. There's a certain continuity in Russ going down there and winning it last night. Take a look at the point standings as a result of last night's action. Kenny Irwin on top of the stack with Mike Stryker second, Reeves, Drynan, and Nichols rounding out the top five. You'll see them next Saturday night on Saturday Night Thunder. We'll be right back. A week from today, a very special day in the world of racing and on ESPN. Richard Petty's last appearance at Daytona, the Richard Petty Special, starting live at 10.30 a.m., preceding the Firecracker 400 at Daytona. So we encourage you to tune in for that uh, celebration of a great career as Richard Petty's farewell tour continues. We promised you at the top of the show, the real Gary and Larry show. You USAC fans know who I'm talking about. Here's our Gary with the real Gary and Larry. You're going to like this. Between the years 1968 and 1972, Larry Dixon and Gary Bettenhausen virtually owned the USAC sprint car division. In fact, during those four years, they each won two championships. When they didn't win the championship, they finished second to each other. In fact, to win a sprint car feature, you had to beat the Larry and Gary show. And perhaps the best way to get these guys to reminisce is to feed them a beer or two and let them bench race. Now, I have to ask you two guys. I mean, you were already established in sprint car competition when uh, a young Bettenhausen came along. You didn't like each other in the beginning, did you? Well, you know, it's just like you, you're asking, uh, Gary. It's like uh, you don't want to see somebody come in that's going to be uh, uh, mess up your deal. You have something going, and you're looking pretty good. And, and uh, at that time, I didn't want to see somebody younger than me come in and just take over, you know. And I was going to make them work for it regardless of whatever happened. And I don't, I think that to be competitive, I don't think that you can really be friends with, or that close with, uh, as far as a race driver to another person. Uh, and I never got to know Gary. I never got to know very many of the race drivers at all. And Larry, Larry and I, we raced probably the first two years and we probably didn't say 20 words to each other. And then it was later on, as we both started to mellow a little bit, that we really got to know each other and appreciate each other. At what point, through all this competition and the mutual respect you two had for each other, did you take a look and say, you know, this guy's all right? Uh, I'd say this would have been in, uh, in the middle 70s before we ever got to where we even associated with one another or talked much and or maybe drank a beer together. It was, it was pretty much after we were through trying to beat each other on the racetrack, you know, that we started looking back at the good times and, and, the, and the hard racing that we had against each other. And I'd go to the racetrack every night, you know, didn't matter where it was, and I thought, boy, if I can beat Dixon tonight, I can win it. And it got to the point for four years where Larry and I were just racing each other, and it was like nobody else was even there. You know, I knew that if I could beat Larry, I could win it, and I think he felt the same way. Now, I know you've got some great stories that you can't tell me on television, but you, you've got to tell me the story about the night you went to watch that modified race in Pennsylvania. Well, Gary is the best teller of this story, <laughs> believe me. And uh, because I think he ended up uh, awake 
Um, a little that, bit longer than you. <laughs> uh, yeah, a little bit longer than I, and uh, and he won the race the next day. Well, what happened, Gary, is we, it was a brand new racetrack, Penn National, half mile dirt track. So I thought I'd sneak into town early and watch the modifieds run the night before just to see what the track was like. Lo and behold, I get there and there's Dixon's already there, see, so. <laughs> Make well, a long story short. to see what it was like, believe me. Well, long, long story short, <laughs> I mean, the track was terrible. It was rough, full of holes, and we ended up on top of his motorhome, and uh, we were drinking some Cokes and other things, and uh, uh, we were watching the Modifieds. Next thing I know, I, I guess Larry got a little bit sick, and... Uh, we had to put him to bed, and I gave him a kiss on his cheek, and I said, uh, well, I'll see you tomorrow. And then about that time, Parsons came along, and he said, boy, you guys are going to feel bad tomorrow. He said, I'll bet you five bucks that I, I'll lap you. So we took the bet. You know, after the heat race, Johnny came down and backed out on the bet. So <laughs> yeah, he said the bet's off. I, I won the, I, anyway, I won the feature, and Larry finished second. So, uh, no, I, or McElroy finished. Ma McElroy finished friends, second. McElroy like, I ran third. Parsons got lapped. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I lapped him twice. <laughs> we was going to do that, do or die. I mean, that had to be. <laughs> After four years of the Larry and Gary show, you went on to win two Silver Crown titles. You came back and won a third USAC Sprint Car title in 1975. But no matter what you have accomplished in your career, you guys are kind of stuck together with the Larry and Gary show. We were meaning to speak to you about that, uh, the Larry and Gary show. That uh, Larry and I were really talking about some legal actions at one time uh, when you guys started using the Larry and Gary phrase. But uh, we thought you didn't have enough money to pay us if we won anyway, so didn't I, matter. <laughs> I can, you know, when you, yeah, when you were saying Larry and Gary show, I, I thought, here, I'm in the house now. How can this be happening? <laughs> And uh, and Gary hadn't called me and said anything to me about it. So, <laughs> but uh, well, I'll tell you what. Over the all the years and all the racing that I've ever done, and of course I haven't really been did that much like Gary has. But I can look back and I think all the fun. I mean, it is fun now when I look back. I can still walk. I can talk about it. My feet work. And uh, I think it's just, uh, I think it's just a hell of a deal that what we did. The Real Larry and Gary Show, 45 victories for Larry Dixon in sprint cars, 40 for Gary. And I have to say, thousands of race fans would have loved to have been in my shoes that day. The hospitality of Wave and Gary Bettenhouse, we had a cookout. I took my uh, twin sons, uh, Sean and Jason, down, and their twins, Todd and Kerry, came by. It was a great day, thanks to the hospitality. Dave? I would only add one thing to that, and that is a subtle distinction. The lawyers assured us that ours is the Gary and Larry show. As you heard there, it was the Larry and Gary show. A subtle distinction, and I would agree with you. That was certainly a delightful five minutes with the guys who are the originals in this business. And we hear Gary may be around here some night. Uh, maybe we can catch him, or some tonight, I should say. Maybe we can catch him before we're done. Got a quick bit of business to do because this guy has got to get back in his race car and go out and do some business. Joe Gertie, you remember from Ventura, was our TV champion out there. Let me congratulate you, first of all, and take care of a presentation that we didn't get to do at Ventura, a beautiful crystal and glass trophy, custom designed for you by Jim Searcy, commemorating, I think, a memorable championship. Congratulations. Well, thanks. You know, there's a lot of people a guy needs to really thank in this deal, Copenhagen Skull, United States Auto Club, and, of course, ESPN for putting all these uh, on, especially that, because the TV, if it wasn't for that, it definitely wouldn't happen. Uh, Ron Rasmussen, the guy that I drove for, uh, he's also the guy working on the dirt champ car tonight. We had a great series. We never really won one, but we was always right there, you know, and, and I thought the last night that we actually had a chance, we got crashed out, so... But it's been a good series. We're going to try to do some more racing yet this summer and uh, just float around. Uh, maybe see me again somewhere. This one goes on the mantle. Now we start worrying about the next one. You're going to make your second Silver Crown start tonight, first on pavement. What do you think? Oh, well, I was a little skeptical at first, but we got time trial. We had a little trouble with the first car, and we had to switch to the second backup car, and we got in tense quick. So uh, it's a long race. Maybe something like this will happen again. All right, a nice piece uh, here from Champion Award, Champ Awards, rather, and Jim Searcy. That one will look good on the mantle. We congratulate our TV champion from Ventura, Joe Gertie, who is now going to go out and try to win another big trophy in tonight's 100 lapper as the Thunderheads gather at IRP.
The Thunder is live from Indianapolis Raceway Park with the USAC Valvoline Silver Crown cars. We are about ready to go racing in the Mellow Yellow 100. He is a jack of all trades. He does it all. Here's Dave. What are you going to do now, Dave? And now I have an opportunity to say, gentlemen, start your engine. And whatever he does, Rice Roney does well. He does it with uh, great uh, dignity, doesn't he? And there is a look at Jack Hewitt. He won our 25-lap qualifier. A look at Joe Gurdy. You just saw him being presented the uh, trophy for winning the uh, TV series with Ventura. As we are preparing for 100 laps, the Valvoline Silver Crown Race, sponsored by Mellow Yellow here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. 24 cars starting once again, the fastest 14 from qualifying, and then the first 10 finishers in our 25-lap qualifiers. 24 cars are now being pushed away. Jim Keeker, the fast qualifier. There's a look at uh, Eric Gordon. There is a look at uh, Keeker in number 26, the fast qualifier. The other yellow number 20 car is Johnny Parsons. He won this race last year after uh, 27 years of a motorsports career. He finally won a silver crown race. That was a very emotional scene in victory lane. And uh, OJP is now a newlywed. Just got married last Wednesday. That's right. He did have, just get married Wednesday night. It was a, a nice little uh, reception he had. We had a lot of fun there. And uh, we're real glad for him and his wife, Kitty. Is it true that I heard a rumor you were dancing with a lampshade on your head? Is that true? Uh, that's not true. I was uh, you know how was, rumors are in racing. It was a water hose I was dancing with. <laughs> and the hose was leading. <laughs> oh no. Well, the cars are uh, started up, making their way down uh, the back stretch in some cases down the front spreader. We're gonna come back and go racing from Indianapolis Raceway Park. Like to remind you, coming up next week, a Speed Week special from Loudon, New Hampshire, Saturday, 7.30. And I got to tell you, Bob Jenkins, Derek Daly is looking for your job. Derek Daly will host from the IndyCar race at Loudon, New Hampshire. Be sure and tune in. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, it is main event time. Without quibbling over which Gary and which Larry are for real, let's go back topside for the call tonight with Gary Lee and Larry Rice. Cars lined up now behind the pace car in the front row. Jim Keeker inside. Last year's winner, Johnny Parsons. And Johnny Parsons has taken a big chance in this race now, Gary. He has put on a softer right rear tire than anybody else in the race. Anybody even softer than the one that Jim Keeker, who is in the other V6 car. So he's taking a chance with that tire on this race. In the second row, Wally Pankratz in 56, Mike Bliss out of Oregon in 69. In row three, on the inside, Tony Stewart, the youngster making his debut, and Russ Gamester. Yes, and Tony Stewart told us that he's he's adapting real quick to these things. He's never run a championship car. He told me they're a lot different. They're a lot slower reacting. He said he's been sick all week, and that's the big concern, if he can last his 100 laps without uh, having some kind of physical uh, strength. In the fourth row, on the inside, a former champion from this series, Jimmy Sills. He was second in the standings last year, and outside, former champion Steve Butler. And Steve Butler broke a push rod in hot laps, so he didn't get as many hot laps as he wanted, but he thinks he's still got to figure it out. In the fifth row on the inside, we'll have Chip Thomas and outside Joe Gurdy in number one. Joe Gurdy is in the Jeff Gordon car. He wasn't scheduled to run this, but he had low oil pressure in the other car, so he gets to drive the famous car. Jim Mahoney and Davey Hamilton occupy row six in the seventh row on the inside. Well, we'll look now at row seven. Eric Gordon and Paige Jones. And Paige Jones put in a lower gear for this race. He wasn't very comfortable entering the corners. He felt with the lower gear, he could enter the corners better. And then in the eighth row, car number 21, the winner of the uh, qualifier, Jack Hewitt, alongside is Tice Carlson. Then it's number 37, Stevie Reeves, Gary Boss from California. In row 10 on the inside, a master of pavement, Mike Podorczyk, and outside, Tony Elliott. In the 11th row, Warren Mockler in 75, alongside is Trey House. And rounding out the field, we've had a chance to visit with him, Larry Dixon on the inside, and outside, number 44 is Greg Staub. Well, who is going to let us ride along with them this evening? Well, one will be uh, Johnny Parsons. Uh, but this is going to be a look from the top of uh, Joe Gurdy's car, CarQuest Age Cam. And as you indicated, this is the car that actually won the series championship last year with young Jeff Gordon. Jeff, of course, now has his commitment to the uh, stock cars. Right, and they have a brand new sponsor in this car. Moen is sponsoring them. They've uh, never been in racing before, so they're real happy to get them involved. But this car is was really being saved for Jeff Gordon if he ever wanted to come back. But when he had trouble with the other, they said, get in that thing. We're going to go racing. Well, Johnny Parsons will also have a camera mounted to his car. He starts outside the front row. A pair of yellow cars up in front. Keeker will bring them around. He has won already this season. 
at Phoenix. There is the green flag. Wally Shear turns the blues for 100 laps in the mellow yellow 100. Right now, the strategy is to go fast enough to be competitive, slow enough to conserve the race car. That's right. And those two lemon drops jump right out there in front. Those two V6 yellow cars jump right out in front of everybody, and it's going to be interesting to see how hard and how fast everybody wants to, wants to chase those guys here at the first race. And look at this. As we look coming right at you, we're going to take a look at the trench cam. They go by for completing lap number one. And look at this, a new innovation. They come at you, they go away from you. <laughs> the never cease, <laughs> miracles never cease. You see everything here, don't you? Top three, there's uh, Keeker and then Parsons. Wally Pancrest out of Orange, California. So Johnny Parsons, the real veteran, can pace himself now because he won this race one year ago. And as you indicated, the experience is vitally important in this particular event. Well, it certainly is. Everybody wants to run fast. They want to keep the leaders in, in front of them. They want to keep close, but they don't want to run fast enough that they're going to burn their tires up. They all know that it's very important, extremely important, not to use your tire up in the first 20 or 30 laps of this race because it's a long, long race. Jim Keeker is off to an excellent season. He won the opening Silver Crown race at Phoenix. He is now sixth in the point standings, but he's also won three times the USAC Sprint Car competition. He leads that point standing. Well, Jimmy Keeker's gained a lot of great experience in the last few years. He's, he's done really much better than I ever thought he would. When I first saw him running that Pontiac Midget, I thought it was the race car that was making him look good. But actually, it wasn't. He's a very good race car driver, and he's going on to prove that over the last couple of years. Let's hop inside Johnny Parsons' mind right now. Is he willing to let the youngster Jim Keeker out of Cicero, Indiana, set the pace? Well, I think he is, because I think he's quite aware that he has that softer right rear tire on there, and he certainly doesn't want to take any chances at abusing it. He's going to let Jim Keeker go out there as long as he can stay close to him and keep him in sight he's going to let him go he just absolutely does not want to take a chance on abusing that right rear tire well you saw that time the red car 56 of wally pancratz take a look to the inside of that yellow number 20 of johnny parsons you know and a, there's a there's a change in position it's that mike bliss. bliss mike bliss out of milwaukee oregon up to third in that dark and red then number 69 Yes, he, he's moved up to third position. This, he's a fairly new kid in the Champ Dirt cars. He hasn't run a whole lot of these cars, but he looks to be very quick right now. The only thing you have to be careful is the guys who start real quick, start passing a lot of cars right at the first of the race. Sometimes they lose it. Sometimes they're so good at the first of the race that when that big fuel load goes away, the rear end gets loose on them. So he's going to have to be careful. With the six-cylinder power plant, a lighter race car, easier on the tires. You mentioned the uh, softer compound earlier. Well, that's right. Uh, Parsons, along with putting on a softer right rear, he put on a harder right front. That, that should make it push more so that he will not use the right rear quite as hard. That was his thinking in putting on that harder right front tire. We're going to have to see uh, how it works out at about 50 or 60 laps. It'll start to tell. Right now, you can see uh, a gap that has developed as they come off the second corner, head down the back stretch, the gap between the first and second. But once again, in a 100-lap race, that is almost immaterial at this point because I cannot see going 100 laps without a yellow. That would close the bunch up. That's right. You're not going to go 100 laps without a yellow. It's very seldom you ever see that. We're looking at a lap time up there in the upper right-hand corner. We're going to see just how fast they're running compared to their qualifying time. If he's uh, really off the pace, how much and, and how conservative he's being at this point. Here we see Mike Liss. He's not content to stay behind Johnny Parson. He wants to get second spot. He thinks that Jimmy Keeker's pulled away a little too much for his liking, and he wants to get into that oh, second spot. A good laugh, though. A good laugh for this early in the race. That's not being too conservative. That's exactly right. Glenn Neibel told me this racetrack is slower now than it was a couple of years ago. They put a new sealer on it about two or three years ago, and that racetrack was very fast for a couple of years. And every year when we come back, it's a little slower. And he didn't really think we were going to see the times that we're seeing right now. Let's take a ride with Joe Gurney as he works to the inside of Chip Thomas. Thomas slides just a bit in that higher groove. They come off the number four corner, head down the straightaway with an excellent crowd here. Just an excellent crowd, perhaps the largest ever for a silver ground race. The battle for a ninth position, ninth on the high side. That's the yellow and red, number 24 of Chip Thomas. And 10th, the number one car of Joe Gurdy. Once again, only his second time in a silver crown car. This is a new experience because he's on pavement, and he's a veteran of dirt cars with the world of outlaws. Exactly. Once again, he's a dirt car specialist. He usually runs that, but on the pavement, I think he's really feeling his way through right now. I think he's getting the, a better feel of the race car. He's getting more confidence in it all the time. And he's catching up with Chip Thomas. So you can see Chip Thomas looks like he's a little bit loose. That back end's hanging out a little bit on him right there as he goes through the corner. And if it's loose this early in the race, 
I think by the time the race is over, it's going to be real, real He's going to be a tired pup after that's 100 laps fighting that thing. That's right, because most of the time you set these race cars up to have a little bit of a push at the beginning of the race. And as that 500-pound fuel load goes away, as you use that fuel up, the back end raises up on the car as, the, as it gets lighter. And therefore, the back end gets looser. So if you have a loose race car at the first of the race, it usually only multiplies as the race goes along. There is a look at Jim Keeker. That's the youngster who is now sixth in the point standings. He's had one victory already in this series. He is leading. And once again, a 100-lap event. A lot of tire smoke there off the 21 car, and that is Jack Hewitt. He was smoking that right rear going into turn one. You don't want to smoke a tire at this length, or in fact, if that came from the brakes, he's hard on the brakes, which is going to abuse those. Well, Jack Hewitt's not a real patient sort of a guy. He wants we to heard run. That. <laughs> he wants to run real fast all the time. So he's he's not going to wait on the tires. He's not going to wait on the guys in front of him. Now you can see, yeah, he is. He's using the brakes. Whoa, we got one through the infield there, and the dust back up on the pavement. Oh, boy. There he was, was hit by somebody. There was contact down there. All we could see was a cloud of smoke. You saw what we saw, but it appeared that, yes, another car was involved in that accident. We yes, saw a cloud of smoke with a, a bright red car sliding through the infield. I'm not sure they actually made contact. I think that white car made contact with the wall trying to miss him. You can't see his number 51 car, Gary. That's 51 Davey Hamilton. is Davey Hamilton. He was the one that took the slide. The Idaho driver who uh, has done very well in the uh, super modified division out on the West Coast. Uh, he takes a look at the damage. As he took that slide, we could not pick up a number of the cars. He was sliding through the dirt across the grass in the infield. There he goes as he's going into turn one. Now he gets back up, and was there contact? Oh, yes, yes, there was contact. There certainly was. I Oh, boy, there was hard contact there, and he almost got upside down and into the fence right there. That's Warren, Warren Mockler Mock in the 75, 75 car. car. Uh, Let's look again. Now, you can see Hamilton sliding through the infield. The car pitches around. He's going to go back off the track with the rear coming, or onto the track, we should say, first. And the contact is right there. Yeah, Dave, Davey Hamilton had no chance to miss him. All that dust, he, he couldn't tell exactly where he was going, where he was heading, and uh, he tried his best to get below him, but he just barely caught that uh, front wheel with his right front, and it put him into the fence. Look at Warren hanging over the fence there. I'm not sure if he's just exasperated or he's frustrated or if perhaps he... Uh, was dinged just a little bit, so he'll have a chance to uh, lean on the wall and collect his thoughts. Uh, Davey is okay, second-generation driver from Boise, Idaho. He walks away. He's okay with the neck roll in one hand, the helmet in the other. So we are under yellow here at Indianapolis Raceway Park. 16 of 30 laps completed. The top five right there. Jimmy Keeker continues to lead. Here on Saturday Night Thunder, well, I'll tell you what, there was some thunder in turn one, and the cleanup is underway now as Warren Mockler and Davey Hamilton have tangled, and we are under yellow. It will give us a moment to bring you that promised look at why Dave Dernwald escaped that fiery crash last week at Winchester. Here's Larry Rice. We talk a lot about safety on Saturday Night Thunder and how we can improve it. Manufacturers spend thousands of dollars every year trying to come up with new designs and new equipment to help the driver survive in case of a crash. Last week, we saw what we thought was a terrible crash at Winchester. When Dave Dernwald hit Ricky Howerton, the car burst into flames. We saw Dave Dernwald sitting there trying to get out of the car. It scared everybody to death. But ultimately, after 25 seconds, he got out of the car and walked away unscathed. Pretty much a miracle, I think. Yet a couple of years before that, we saw Gary Bettenhausen in a similar fire at Indianapolis Raceway Park. He also crawled out and rolled on the ground but he was burned. He ended up in the hospital with second-degree burns. What was the difference? Well, let's take a look at the equipment and see if we can help explain that. We have two uniforms here. This is a brand new one, and this is the one that Dave Dernwald wore in that crash last week. As you can see, there are burns all up and down the legs. There are burns on the arms and burns all the way up the back. Yet none of the flames got to him. The glove is all wrinkled from the heat, but his hands didn't get burned. The shoelaces on this shoe were burned off, but his feet didn't get burned. Here we have the tear-off. It's actually melted to the shield, but his face also was not burned. What was the difference? Well, I think the difference was that Dave Dernwald had on his insulated underwear that helped protect him. Gary Benhausen will tell you that that's the only time he ever got in a race car without the insulated underwear. And because of that, he ended up in the hospital. 
The insulated underwear gives you an added protection, an added insulator between the driver and the heat. The bad rap on the underwear is that it's too hot. I don't want to wear it. It's uncomfortable. Well, the fact is, it's proven that with the underwear on, your body heat is actually cooler than without it. So guys, take a good look and wear your underwear next time. And Larry Rice, the attitude, it can't happen to me, has no place in racing when it comes to wearing the safety gear. Exactly right. Part of the responsibility of safety lies directly with the driver. There are a lot of things that he can do to help himself. And I think a lot of guys say, well, I don't want to, I don't, it's not comfortable, it doesn't do this, doesn't do that. That's baloney. It helps save your life and save injuries. Let's go back down and check in with the Davey Hamilton to see what uh, triggered that melee down there in turn one, Dave. Well, that's exactly the question for Davey. You kind of went down through there kicking up all kinds of dust and creating all kinds of fuss, but it wasn't your fault. What well, happened? I, I tell you what, it wasn't very fun uh, from my point of view either. We was going down the front straightaway, just kind of hanging in there. It was early in the race, and uh, the brake caliper broke, and it flew up, and it landed in the cockpit, and I didn't know what it was at first, and I went to hit the brakes to go on the corner, and there was nothing there. And, there was a bunch of guys in front of me I didn't want to run into, so I hit for the grass and tried to get it sideways, but so it's water down there and slick, and we went across the track, and we, we banged it pretty hard, but uh, we're all right, so we just try to get that car fixed for the next one. Once you realize you're not going to get it stopped, you know you're heading back up for the racetrack. What's going through your mind? Well, you know, I was hoping that nobody else was going to get involved with me. First of all, you know, you, you, know, you hate to take anybody out because your car broke and, you, and you're involved in an accident. And, and uh, for, unfortunately, we got somebody down there. But, uh, you know, as I was going across the racetrack, I knew there was a lot of guys behind us. And I was just hoping that uh, we were going to stay clear, but uh, we weren't quite that lucky. We're glad you're OK. Warren Mockler is also OK. Let's go back up topside to Gary and Larry. They're being shown the uh, furled flag indicating one lap before we go green. Let us mention, Larry, that three past winners of this event are here this evening but failed to make the feature. George Snyder won this event a couple of years ago. Bob Ciccone and Bruce Field are all three spectators and all three good race drivers. Well, that only goes to point out how very, very tough it is. Here you see who, hey, who has won this thing in the past, and it's very tough. All these guys that have already missed it. Schrader, of course, is not here. Parsons uh, is running second right now. Field missed it. Uh, so it's it's a tough race to make and an even tougher race to win. Be interesting to see how this folds out. We still have uh, three-fourths of the race to go. The yellows do count this evening over 100 laps, and uh, Jim Keeker leads the veteran Johnny Parsons. Keeker the fast qualifier. Parsons the winner here one year ago. And we are going racing with Joe Gurdy. The green flag flies down the front stretch into the 13-degree banking of turn one. That's a very good shot. Joe Gurdy's down on the bottom side. As he moves down, Jim Mahoney went right by him on the outside. You get stuck down on the bottom, you better be fast, and you better get into the corner hard. And when he didn't, Jim Mahoney took advantage and went around him on the outside. We talked earlier about the lead that Jim Keeker had built up over Johnny Parsons. Perhaps Johnny let him go, but then the yellow bunches them up again, and Parsons right on the rear bumper. Well, Parsons seems a little more aggressive now. He's running a little higher on the racetrack. He seems like he's uh, ready to give uh, Keeker a little bit of a challenge right now. He's uh, very fast. He's running faster than Keeper is at this very point in the race. This also, this yellow period, allows them to cool those tires off a bit. Well, let them cool the tires off. Let them gather their thoughts. Let them rethink how they, what they want to do and how they want to do it. I, I'm impressed with how high Parsons is running. The higher you run on this racetrack, usually the better your race car feels because you have to be very certain what that race car is going to do to run in the corner that hard, that high. That is Keeker in the 26 car leading. The 20 car is Parsons. Back there in third, that dark 69 is Mike Bliss. But earlier, maybe Mike was a little too aggressive too early, but yet it's too early to tell. Yeah, you really don't know. You can't tell until it all uh, kind of unfolds. I think that was Jack Hewitt down on the inside there, Gary, that we saw getting past. He's got a problem pulling the inside of the racetrack. But look at Parsons. He's going to have to get up far enough coming off of four. He wants very badly to be able to pull up the side of Jim Keeker coming off of four right there because he thinks Keeker's running a little bit too low. But he has to make certain that he gets up far enough that Keeker sees it because if he doesn't, Keeker will pinch him into the fence and they'll both uh, crash. If you were in the cockpit of the number 20 car right now riding in second place, would you be content to just ride back there and let Keeker set the pace? You know, I always played the race. That's Hewitt down on the inside there, Gary, pulling in. I always played the race according to how my race car felt. If I felt very comfortable uh, up there and I, I couldn't really comfortably pass him, I'd be content running in second. But if I was just running so much faster than he was at this point in the race, I'd go ahead and take the lead. I, I wouldn't wait on him. I wouldn't slow down my pace to wait on him. But if I couldn't do it comfortably, I certainly wouldn't have used my tire or my car at this point. Well, in the meantime, they build up a few car length advantage over third place. Mike Bliss, and Bliss has a bit of a 
gap over this battle right here for fourth and fifth. That's Wally Pankretz in that first red car. That's Russ Gamester in the 85 car right on his tail, Gary. He's Russ is a, a pretty good veteran at these race cars. He's run these cars for the last year, year and a half. He's become very proficient. He does very well in them. And he's going to come up here and give battle to Wally Pankratz. He was third in the point standings last year. A very impressive season for a guy that had been a former USAC midget champion. Well, this car that he's driving has always been a good race car. Andy Hellenberg used to drive this race car. Had great success with it. And now that, that Gaines has moved into it, he's also been successful with it. Once again, a 100-lap event, a rather unique format for uh, us here on Saturday Night Thunder. We only have now about 33 laps complete, a lot of laps to go. A good look there at uh, Steve Butler, and Jimmy Sills, and Tony Stewart. And you're impressed with Tony Stewart. In fact, Tony says this was his first ride in a silver crown car. He's going to make his first ride on dirt in a sprint car tomorrow night in Kokomo. It's a big weekend for the youngster. Well, he's, he's had a lot of firsts in the last year and a half because he had never driven anything bigger than a TQ until just about just a little over a year ago. So he's going to have a lot of firsts. But he, he's a very talented young man. If he, he has a lot of patience. He shows me a lot of patience. Every time he gets in a different kind of race car, he shows me a lot of intelligence because he doesn't go out there and try to out-muscle the race car. He drives it to the best of his ability as fast as he does. Best racing on the track right now, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. They are all together in the race track, and you mentioned something that I want to underscore. Tony Stewart does use his head, and that's something that not always happens with a young, aggressive driver. Well, that's usually you have. Usually, you talk about in sports, you talk about pumping up an athlete. You have to pump him up. You got to fire him up. Well, in racing, usually a young kid, you have to unpump. They're so pumped up, they get themselves in all kinds of trouble. So you have to deflate them. You have to slow them down. Tell them to take their time. Jimmy Sills in that red number two going to the inside of Steve Butler. He makes the pass, and uh, Tony Stewart going to school and watching the move, and he looked to the inside but didn't have the momentum to cut down to the inside of Butler. You can see the way those cars waver a little bit, how that fuel affects them. When you get that rig, that back end out just a little bit with 500 pounds of fuel back there, they do want to waver in, and it makes the waver look a lot more spectacular than maybe it would be if there wasn't so much weight hanging out behind those wheels. Well, you have four red cars right together and a black car, so it's kind of tough to tell them all apart. You have to look at those numbers. The black car. Right, we go back in the cockpit with uh, Joe Gurney right now. Joe driving the car that uh, won the Silver Crown title last year with uh, Jeff Gordon in the cockpit. He is now in the 11th position. We look back off the rear of the car. Now back in the 13th degree, back into the turn. Yeah, as we watch these guys, Gary, oh, look at this. We're already starting to lap cars. We're on lap 38, I guess, right now, 30, 37. And this completed lap 39. Dave? Just a couple of points that we might make here. One, Mike Fedorchik came in under that yellow to change tires. They couldn't get the lug nut off the car. Got it completed just as the race went back to green. Came in on yellow, can't go back on green. Fedorchik is out of the race. And as we watch the V6s perform up front here, running one, two with a lap car in between them, Perhaps a question to Larry Rice, who helped develop this V6 motor. Will this be the trend of the future? Will more guys be going to V6s? Will the old V8s? Uh, are their days numbered in this division, maybe, Larry? Well, I think so, Dave. I think that uh, I'm really surprised that it hasn't happened before this. I mean, Glenn and I will develop this, started developing this V6 back in the mid-80s, 85, 86, I think I drove that car. We ran second at the fairgrounds about the third time it ever was on the racetrack. And, but it took all this time for anybody else to catch on. So, uh, you know, I think that definitely you're going to see more and more of them. You know, the 200-pound weight advantage on a racetrack like this, you can see that it, they're quite dominant, I think. We're we'll also seeing more than V6 in sprint car competition. I do indeed think that we will see many more to come in the future. But right now we're talking about the Silver Crowns, and we're going to take a break here momentarily, but you'll not miss any of the action. If something happens, we'll have it on you for tape. There it is, 42 of laps. Keeper continues to lead. As we approach the halfway point of the Mellow Yellow 100, Jim Keeper continues to lead, utilizing that V6 engine and V6 chassis, and he has uh, pulled out to a bit of a lead over Johnny Parsons, who rides in second, as Keeper continues to negotiate his way through traffic, and that is another aspect of this particular race. At that long as we pan back, look for Parsons, as Parsons comes into your screen, you can see about four or five lap cars between first and second. Johnny Parsons was the second fastest qualifier this evening. He is the winner of this race last year. Yes, and, and Keeker has established a very good lead at this point. Parsons is running pretty quick. He's 
established a bit of a lead over uh, Mike Bliss, who's running third. Here's fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh right there, all in the pack. This is the best race. And I think that uh, right now, these guys are running very quick. Look at Tony Stewart. Kept the momentum up, made a pass, and moved up to fifth position. Right. Fifth, sixth and seventh right there. Tony Stewart in fifth. Sixth is Butler, and seventh now is Gamester. Yes, and the guy that we missed in there was Jimmy Sills. He is running right in front of this pack of cars, and I think he's the fastest race car on the racetrack right now. He went around these four cars and is picking up on Mike Bliss. I think uh, Jimmy Sills is very quick at this point in the race. Well, Sills would be fourth. He uh, won the championship with Bob Pisani a couple of years ago. Then they, uh, they parted company, if you will. They're back together. That was a good marriage, and right now they're running together as a team as we go back to the cockpit with Joe Gurney, a man that is only making his first appearance on a fave track of a silver crown car. This is good education. Right, and I think that's exactly what he's doing. He's going to school. He's riding around out there. He's running pretty quick. Not quick enough to be up with the leaders, but he's learning all the time. He's feeling out the race car, and uh, maybe in the last half of the race, he'll get to feeling better. There's a look at that uh, group of cars running fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth. And here they come, right over your head. Bing. With the new innovation, we can look at them coming at you and look at them going away from you. And look at Stewart. Look at the kid move to the inside, down the back stretch. I'm impressed with Tony Stewart. He's running pretty quick at this point in the race, I think. He's, uh, where is he running? Sixth right now. And right behind him, he, he's got some guys really right on his tail. But he's pushing Wally Pancrest. He's giving him, oh, he's going to go right under him. He's going to give him a shot right here. Can't quite do it. Paul. It's a big break for Tony Stewart to be in this car maintained by Ben Leva. Ben's been around for a lot of years. It's a good racing team. Well, of course, Bruce Field won in this race car a few years ago. Or I'm not sure whether it's exactly the same race car. Same team. Ben, ben, same team, Benny Lieber's race car, uh, rinsed by Jack Steck. So it is, they know what, how to set the race car up, and that helps him a whole lot. Here's Mahoney in the 88 car. He also, he's gained a lot of spots in this race. He's moved he's up, up very well. He's moved up very well, and he's working there on that 10 car, Steve Butler. Uh, he's another kind of a pavement specialist who doesn't always get his correct dues, but he's a very quick little guy. Well, here's a youngster taking on a veteran. Wally Pankratz out of Orange, California, has a 21-year-old daughter, Randy, who is racing at TQs out there on the coast. Former college basketball player is watching her dad this evening from California. There's and Mahoney. There Mahoney as we go back to the front of the pack. Once again, there is uh, Jimmy Keeker. And Keeker, we thought early on, was setting a very pa fast pace. He's not backed out of it. There's, There's another look at uh, Mahoney there in that uh, third car back. He has moved up another spot. He has moved. He's right behind Tony Stewart right now. He's in seventh position. Tony Stewart's in sixth, and that's fifth spot up there. As you see, Tony Stewart, he got a little loose. He ran low for about three laps trying to get around Wally Pan Pancrest, and when he did, he might have heated up that right rear. He wants to be careful to take a little bit of care of that tire. He doesn't want to get it too hot. One thing a new driver in this series has always told at the start of the race to be careful because of all that fuel and the weight right behind the cockpit. Exactly. I think most of these guys have done a very good job of, of that. But look at Mahoney right now. He ran a quick corner right there. He's out of the groove. He was lower than everybody else. Still fast. And look at this. Now he went right on past Pancrest. And, and look Stewart, at Stewart. Stewart follows him right on through. That was a great move by Tony Stewart. When, when he moved Pancrats over, when Mahoney moved him over, boy, Stewart took advantage of the situation, followed him right on. And I was watching the, the grandstand over here, and Tony Stewart has so many fans here. They all stood up giving an ovation as he made that pass. We're on the uh, lap now of Jim Keeger. Let's see how quick he is running out in the lead as he works off that corner. Here comes the yellow car. 22.5. Oh, I think... I think was that Keeker we were on, or was that uh, Mahoney we were on? I was prepared to... That was the 88 car. We were on Mahoney that time. Not, okay. Uh, not Keeker. Don't get a lap on Keeker there compared to what he was done earlier. We now have 40 laps to go. 60 laps in, 40 laps to go. Still a very long race. 22.5 is still awfully fast to this point in the race. At least I feel it is. Because if you have a long way to go, you have to run quick, but not too quick. It's, it's uh, The guys are doing a great job. Mahoney and Stewart right there. This is Stewart in that black number three car. Once again, both of these guys uh, kind of unheralded, both doing an excellent job out here tonight. I think Tony Stewart, uh, if he doesn't get tired, he's in for a good finish. He may not win it, 
But I, I still have a little fear that he might get a little bit tired in this race. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's a youngster, though. Well, I know, but he's old guys out here running. I know, but he told me he got tired last week at Winchester. Believe me, that place will make you tired. And 100 laps here is, is pretty tough to run. And if you've been sick all week, it even makes it tough. You know, from up here and on television, it looks like a long straightaway, a chance to race. But realistically, we characterize this track as two very, very sweeping turns and two short straightaways. That's exactly right. You're, you're using your arms. You're turning the race car all the way through the corner. It's a lot of concentration. Look at this. Keeker's already up to Eric Gordon last year. And Gordon is 12. So only 12 cars on the lead lap. And right now, Keeker is going to work on him. And right in front of uh, Gordon was that number one car of Gurdy. There's a look at Pancrast again. And there is Russ Gamester in the red 85 looking to the inside of Wally Pancrast. That's the battle for eighth and ninth right there. I think Wally has developed uh, some sort of a problem. I think the race car has gotten real loose because everybody seems to be giving a shot at him right now. So something we have not talked about so far this evening is the win challenge. Keeker is the fast qualifier. If he can win this race, what's he pick up? About uh, 5,500 extra dollars from wins if he can pull off the victory after qualifying for the pole. Exactly right. $5,500 is not pocket. I think the purse pays about 7,000 to win, so five on top of that. This be a real healthy payday for Jim Keeker. So Keeker, who won the uh, opening race on the uh, mile at Phoenix back in January. He is six to the point center, but right now he has led to the starting green. We'll see if he can take the victory. Stay with us. Laps to go from Indianapolis Raceway Park in the Mellow Yellow 100. We take a look at Jimmy Keeker. He continues to lead. He was third in this event last year and finished 12th back in 1988. He was the fast qualifier and stands to get an additional 5,500 bucks from wins in the Wins Extend Challenge if he can win after setting quick time. And he has led all 67 laps this evening. Third place, here is the battle right here. And Jimmy Sills has just gone around Mike Bliss. And look at Mike Bliss. He doesn't like that. He's going to go back after him, coming off a of two. And back by him going into three. Mike Bliss from Milwaukee, Oregon. And uh, Placerville, California, the hometown of Jimmy Sills. When Mike comes to town, he brings mom, dad, sometimes his brothers. Well, he, he I think Jimmy Sills woke him up a little bit. He might have just been resting out there thinking that there's nobody in front of him from behind him. But as soon as Jimmy Stills went around him, boy, it woke him up in a hurry. And he went right back on by and is pulled out to about a four or five car lead. Look at the gap now between that's the uh, battle for third position. Once again, Keeker is your leader. And the Parsons second. And there is the best battle on the racetrack. Mike Bliss at 69. And then Jimmy Sills in the red number two. Minor concrete entry. And here is your leader in traffic. That is one element that plays this type of race. The long race, you have to work the traffic. Well, and he's just, oh, he got a little sideways right there. Just as I started to say, he's doing an excellent job in the traffic. He did get a little sideways trying to get under Steve Butler right there. But Butler's running 10th, so right now, if he can get by, no, 7th. He's running 7th. So only 7 cars remain on the lead lap, but you have to be impressed with this ride by uh, Keeper this evening. Well, this car, Glenn Nibels, has, has won a lot of races all over the country. They've won Phoenix. They've won here. They've won a lot of different races. And uh, Jim Keeker just carries on the tradition of showing everybody that that is really a fast race. That's the 6R race car that they debuted at the Copper Classic in Phoenix, the uh, V6 power plant and the V's chassis. And he is still looking to the inside of Butler. Butler, uh, one year, won both the sprint title and the silver crown title in the same season. That's not easy to do. Now we have the lap counter on Keeker to see just how quick he is running now as he works lap 77. This is a 100-lap event with the... V6 allowing for a lighter race car. They go to a softer compound tire, but let's see what kind of a lap he turns now as he completes lap 77. Well, interestingly enough, I don't think Jim Keeker's running any softer tires than anybody else, but he's running faster than everybody else. Bar Parsons, Parsons is running the softer compound. He is back in second position, but right now for JP to have any kind of a shot at this victory, he will need a yellow flag. Yes, he will. Jimmy Keeker, I talked to him a little earlier, and his philosophy is you have to finish the race. He said, I'm going to use the same tire as everybody else, a little harder tire, because I just want to make sure it lasts. And obviously, he made a very good choice. But that lightness of that race car, ooh, we almost had trouble there. Mike Bliss and uh, Joe Gurdy got together coming off that corner, and Joe Gurdy went way to the inside, but everything came out okay. As we take a tight shot now, 69, Mike Bliss down the back stretch. Here is a look at the CarQuest cage cam. Not mounted on the cage here. Down on the uh, down tube, looking back over that left rear as he negotiates turn four. And you 
you'll see the grandstand coming up. Uh, well, you won't see the grandstand. You'll see the pit area from that shot. That's right. You can see the muffler standing up over the left rear wheel. That's the muffler sticking up in the air there that they must run on these silver ground cars. They almost run mufflers all the time. And they're pretty loud even with the mufflers on quite honestly. Again, only five cars now on the lead lap, and the leader is about to complete lap number 80. We still have 20 laps to go, and we'll come back for the conclusion of the Mellow Yellow 100 from Indianapolis Raceway Park as the thunder continues. With 15 laps to go, there is your leader, Jim Keeker. He now enjoys a seven-second lead over a great battle that is developing for second place. Johnny Parsons, qualified second, has won in that position throughout the balance of this race. However, Mike Bliss has closed in the challenge for that position. Mike Bliss is doing a great job. He has picked up on John Parsons. I'm not sure whether Parsons' decision on tires was exactly the right thing because he doesn't seem to be uh, running nearly as fast as Keeker, and right now, uh, Bliss is giving him all he wants. I think Bliss is running faster. He just can't find a way around him at this point. Parsons in the Jeep Nolan uh, Silver Crown car, and uh, Del McClure, the owner, that's a black 69. That is the best battle right now on the racetrack in the waiting lap of the Mellow Yellow 100. They're working on lap 87. I think the best thing that ever happened to Mike Bliss is when old Jimmy Sills came up there and passed him. All of a sudden woke him up, brought him out of his trance. And Here comes Sills, too. Sills closing in that uh, fourth position. Sills still may be the fastest car out there. Well, I, I don't think so. I think Mike Bliss was the fastest car for a little while, but now that it seems Parsons is pulling away and Sills is starting to catch it. So it may be that Sills, once again, has picked up a little speed. Well, this is the point in the race, though, uh, Larry, where your strategy starts to play out. Did we go with the, the right tire compound? Did we use up too much tire early? Now is when you really understand whether your strategy worked. Exactly. Now, now's the time you got to go for it. There's no more waiting on things. You've got to, whatever you got left, you've got to let it all hang out right now. We always talk about dirt track racing being like rock and roll dancing. Well, this is the time to go rocking and rolling, boys. You got to go for it. There is a battle for third spot right there. The 69 car. That is Mike Bliss. The red car right behind him is the number two car of Jimmy Sills. So you see second, third, and fourth right together. The battle for third right there. I think Sills, I think you're right. I think Sills is the fastest race car out there right now. Maybe Keeker's faster, but of that, those three, he seems to be fastest. But every time he pulls down, he has to pinch the car. He loses a lot of speed. Even if we had a yellow at this point, there would be so many lap cars between first and second that Keeker would still have the, uh, the big margin. Well, Jimmy Keeker actually doesn't have as big a margin right now. He's got about a straightaway lead. And that's that's not as big as I really expected he might have at this point. Because he, after he got to a certain point, it seems like he might have slowed his pace just to maintain that distance. Now a lap car between second and third. A red car between Parsons and Bliss is a lap down, and that's Steve Butler. That's Steve Butler. He's, uh, he's kind of holding him up. But if Bliss doesn't get around him, Sills is going to go around both of them. Gonna have to do it now. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Sills is gonna pull right up there. You better make this pass quick or Sills gonna go around him and then he'll have a shot at Johnny Parsons. Sills still on the inside of Steve Butler. Butler back there in the seventh position. So you have fourth place trying to lap seventh position. Only four cars now remain on the lead lap. Jimmy Sills, that red number two, is the last driver on the lead lap. And right now, your leader is just completing lap 93. Seven laps to go for Jimmy Keeker. Parsons right now has gained two seconds on Jim Keeker in the last few laps. I don't know whether he's got enough time to make up those last five seconds or not, but he is starting to roll him in a little bit. So this might be interesting as we get close to the finish. There's a look to the inside. Jimmy Sills on the inside makes the pass. Gets very, very low on the racetrack, but he makes that race car stick, or does he? Pushes up high, and here comes Mike Bliss side by side across the start finish line, and Bliss has the advantage by a nose, and then Sills goes by. Sills did a great job braving that thing into the corner. He, he knew that if he let off too early, uh, Bliss was going to run right up in front of him and take that position back. He did a very good job to run that thing in there. Oh, we got some we got sparks, some sparks coming off a car right up there in front of that's Eric Gordon. That's Eric Gordon in the sixth car. And you can see the car sparking right in front of Joe Gurney. Five laps to go. Only five laps remain between, uh, well, Keeker and a $5,500 bonus for wins. Yeah, he's got that thing well in sight right now. I think uh, I think he's lost the right rear torsion arm. I think that thing's laying clear down on the ground. That's why all the sparks are flying. And Keeker's a little nervous. He doesn't want to get up there and get uh, involved in any kind of a crash with him right at this point. Four laps to go as you ride now with Joe Gurney, and you can see that sparking car of Eric Gordon right in front. And right in front of Eric is the yellow number 
26 of Keeker. Keeker into turn three. And now we look at uh, Keeker again, very low on the racetrack, gingerly working his way through traffic, down to now three laps to go. 97 laps complete. I'm sure this is not the position he wants to be in. He's behind some slower cars. He's not real sure what they're going to do. He doesn't want to be behind them if they make a mistake, but yet he doesn't want to slow down enough to let them go on by. So he's got to try to pass them. And as he does, Parsons keeps reeling him in little by little, but I just don't think there's going to be enough. But unlike IndyCar racing or Winston Cup racing, these guys are not utilizing headsets, radio communication, so they can only go by a pit board. It's very difficult to see any kind of a hand signal. So obviously, Keeker is not aware of the lead that he has right now. Well, no, he, I'm sure that uh, he's not aware. I know he has, thinks he has a lead. I'm sure he's aware that he has a pretty good size lead, but he's not really aware how good size it is. Here comes the white flag from starter Wally Shearer. One lap to go. And this will be a big, fat payday for Jim Keeker of some $12,500 between the purse and the $5,500 wins challenge money. The first driver this year to win a race after being the fast qualifier. While we're watching all this, Jim Mahoney has come clear from the back. I think he's up to third position now, isn't he? I think Mahoney is up to third position. A very, very gratifying victory for Keeker. The fans on their feet as he takes the uh, twin checkered flags from Wally Shear. And you're right, I think uh, it was an excellent late race charge by uh, Jim Mahoney as we look at uh, Jim Keeker, the veteran from Cicero, Indiana. And for the second time this season, he brings that uh, beast V6 to uh, victory lane. He won at Phoenix, and now he's won again, and he'll jump back up to the points lead, and we'll come back and have a chance to visit with victorious Jim Keeker as we return to Raceway Park. In-car camera shots provided by CarQuest Auto Parts Store for your nearest CarQuest Auto Parts Store. Dial 1-800-492-PARTS. Jim Keeker is victorious this evening at Indianapolis Raceway Park in the Mellow Yellow 100 for the USAC Valvoline Silver Crown Cars. It is a jubilant victory lane, and right in the middle of it is our Dave Spain. Yes, indeed. Right down here for the payday. Jim Keeker, $7,000 plus another $5,600 from Wins. Congratulations. The Wins Extend Board brings the payday to $12,600, I believe. <laughs> uh, quite a night. Uh, people from Valvoline like to thank them for helping us out. Mellow Yellow, the Wins people, uh, my sponsor DuPont, and all the guys from 6R Racing. What a night. After you make the debut in this car with the win out at the Copper Classic, obviously you had to have pretty good feelings about the way this season was going to go. Did you feel like it was going to go this well? Well, uh, we qualified fast time, and I was a little concerned because the car was uh, kind of skatey. We ran a hard tire, and we knew we'd have to to make it live, and uh, turned out to work real good. What about uh, getting this thing going on dirt now? You didn't make the show over at the fairgrounds, but on pavement, you got to, you got the thing aced. What's the plan for the rest of the series? Well, we're going to run all the dirt shows. Uh, I need some time on the dirt, and the only way you're going to get any better is run the laps. So uh, my guys will stay with me the rest of the year, whether we come in first or last. So. Yeah, that was one of the things I liked a couple of weeks ago was in the, uh, in the uh, piece we did, the interview in the shop. You talked about the, the three goals that this team uh, has. Run that by uh, again for the folks who might not have been tuned in that night. They got uh, three deals, and the first one is my safety. The second one is that we have fun, and the third uh, priority is that we do as good as we can. You came home in one piece. I suspect it was a lot of fun, and you did pretty well here tonight. Let me ask you a little bit about the race. When you jump out front like that, you then are uh, responsible for setting the pace. Did you have a strategy going in for how hard you wanted to go, or were you going to play the race by ear? I was going to drive the car as hard as I could without hurting the tires, and, and that's basically what I did. I, I uh, ran it a little hard a couple times getting by some guys, some lap cars, but uh, I really wasn't stretching it out too much. I was trying to keep the tires underneath me. Are you aware as the race evolves what kind of lead you've got in this case over Parsons? Uh, I had some, some of my guys from my pit were down there giving me some hand signals and, and that helps a lot. A couple times I held my hand out like where in the heck am I? <laughs> <laughs> and of course uh, while you're uh, not when you're not uh, winning uh, Silver Crown uh, races, you're also leading the sprint car division, so we're going to see some more of you on Saturday Night Thunder. When you wrap it all up, this is turning out to be a heck of a Jim Keeker season. Yeah, it is. We're, uh, we're going to try and run for the sprint car points, and this is our rookie year with the Silver Crown cars, so uh, maybe with two wins, we'll, we might wrap up the rookie of the year. Yeah, you may do okay if you keep at it. Congratulations. A great job tonight. Thanks a lot.
Jim Keeker comes home a winner. A healthy payday indeed here in Silver Crown action at Indianapolis Raceway Park. We'll be back with more right after this timeout. Stay with us. Saturday Night Thunder has been brought to you by the more than 600 AutoZone stores across America. AutoZone, the right parts at the right price. And by Suzuki. Your Suzuki dealer has the ride you've been waiting for and the financing to get it. Payday for Jim Keeker here at Indianapolis Raceway Park, and a big payday it is. And the guys who chased him are here. Jimmy Sills finishing third tonight. Johnny Parsons, the defending champion in the race, comes home with a second-place finish. And I guess the obvious question is, did you or did you not make the right tire choice? Well, uh, you know, we, we, we got together and agreed on a softer right rear tire, and it was looking good, as you saw, on the restart. And the initial start, uh, my balance wasn't quite right, so I just held on. And we were hoping for a late yellow like last year, but it didn't happen. Congratulations, by the way, on the wedding. We saw some of the pictures. It looked very nice. Congratulations. Good. Thank you very much. What, uh, what's the plan now? You, what, tell me about the rest of the season. What do you got lined up? We're going to keep racing the uh, champ cars and uh, hopefully get in the Indy car before the end of the season and work on a uh, real good ride for Indy next year, racing sprint cars out here at Raceway Park and some midgets too. First and second in two races, not bad. Good work, Johnny Parsons. How about it, Jimmy Stills? You got close to him there at the end. Looked like you might have something for him. What happened? Well, I picked up a push there at the end, and I couldn't roll the corner, and I couldn't maneuver traffic very well. But, uh, you know, those guys were running good, and, and we, I guess we were first in class tonight. We were the first V8 in the race, and those V6s are pretty tough on these pavement deals. But uh, Goodyear tires worked real good tonight, and uh, Pioneer concrete car worked great, and Carrera shocks. And, and uh, we were closing there for a while. You know, I couldn't believe that I could... Those guys kind of went away, and pretty soon they started all coming back to me. And, and, uh, but I just didn't have enough at the end to get by them. Good run, Jimmy. Congratulations. Let's go back up topside. Gary and Larry got the full field rundown for us. Well, once again, it's Jim Keeker uh, defeating last year's winner, Johnny Parsons. You just heard from Jimmy Sills, who was third. Mike Bliss, fourth. Rounding out the top five, Jim Mahoney, who was a lap down, only the first four in the lead lap. Then in the second five, Tony Stewart in his Silver Crown debut, Steve Butler, Stevie Reeves, Chip Thomas, and Russ Gamester. Then we go to another panel. We're showing Eric Gordon. Joe Gertie finishes 12th. And Wally Pankratz, Tony Elliott, and Larry Dixon finishes 15th. And it's Trey House, Greg Staub, Kerry Foss, Paige Jones, and Jack Hewitt. And finally, uh, rounding out the field, Tice Carlson, Mike Fedorchek, Davey Hamilton, and Warren Mockler. Well, the points uh, shaken just a bit with Keeker going back uh, into the lead now with his second victory of the season. He has 240 markers. Leland McSpadden, who uh, had a lousy night, but at one victory already this year, is second. Then it's Jimmy Sills, Mike Bliss, and Jeff Swindell rounding out the top five. So once again, our congratulations to Jim Keeker. There's a check for 7,000 bucks for winning it, but he also gets 5,600 for being the fast qualifier and for winning the race from win. So, uh, Dave, what a great night here at Raceway Park. Well, it was indeed. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Hope you Thunderheads all across America had as much fun tonight as we did. Nobody had more fun than Jim Keeker, who comes home with his second Silver Crown win in three starts. And we congratulate him on behalf of all the Saturday Night Thunder crew. Baseball tonight coming up. Be sure and stay tuned for that. And then, of course, Sunday Night Baseball coming out tomorrow night, and that'll be Chicago at New York. We want to remind you once again, we've got a special Speed Week live from the IndyCar race in New Hampshire next weekend. You'll want to be tuned in for that. We're off to Winchester to celebrate the 4th of July at a great, great racetrack. And we certainly hope you'll join us then. Here tonight, Jim Keeker takes home the gold in a 100-lapper for the Silver Crown cars on behalf of our Gary and Larry. Gary Lee and Larry Rice, we thank you all so much for joining us. Be sure to come back again next week. It's the Midgets and the Hills of Winchester. Winchester on Saturday Night Thunder. Been a pleasure being with you. We'll see you next week when the Thunder rolls once again on ESPN. I'm Dave Despain. So long from Indianapolis Raceway Park.